Good afternoon and welcome to the Flagler Museum and the 29th Annual Whitehall Lecture Series. My name is John Blades, I'm the director of the museum and it's a pleasure to welcome you all here this afternoon for the second in a series of five lectures. This year's theme, Crimes of the Century, and um, we'll be exploring some of the crimes that really made uh, immediate, immediate sensation late 19th, early 20th century. Before we begin, let me just take a second to remind you to turn off your cell phones. Please don't take for granted that they're turned off. Um, please take a minute just to make sure they are. And if you happen to wander into the room with a museum's audio tour one, would you hold that up so the staff can come and collect that? Those audio tour ones have internal alarms that can be set off by the AV system and believe me, they will wake the dead if that alarm goes off. These uh, lectures are webcast live, so if you are un unable to attend a lecture in the future, you can go to the museum's website to the lecture series webpage, click on a link there, download a, a, a small uh, application that will allow you to hear the lecture live, to see the same slides we all are seeing in the room today, and to even submit questions to the lecture. In fact, we've got a few people who've joined us live for the webcast, and I want to welcome them to the lecture as well. Uh, and that's worldwide, so it's a great advantage, I think, no matter where you are, you can join these lectures. And then furthermore, we capture these lectures in a few weeks each, after each lecture, we uh, edit them and post them on something called the Gilded Age History Channel. It's a web page that the museum created. It's a, it's a program guide to more than 100 videos about this time period in American history. In fact, our purpose in doing this lecture series is to really help give context to this period in American history. It's a fascinating period. It's a period in which we Americans really invented ourselves, the period that really created the character that we all grew up with and have taken for granted. It's fun to explore how that, all that took place. This lecture series wouldn't be possible without sponsors like the Max and Victoria Dreyfus Foundation and the Palm Beach Post, and we also get grants from the Palm Beach County Cultural Council that make all these things work. I also want to thank the staff of the museum. There's a lot of work that goes into one of these things, and it's, it's true that the better we are at our jobs, the easier it looks to everybody. I know that most people, it looks like we sort of flip on the lights, maybe mow the lawn once in a while, knock the dust off of things, and collect money at the door, right? But it's a lot more than that to make a place like this work, believe me. And there are lots of other programs here at the museum I hope you'll enjoy throughout the season. You have it at your seat. It's a season program guide, a guide to all the programming here at the museum. In fact, anybody here today has, that has joined us that was here for Uni Han's concert a couple of weeks ago? Our pianist, Uni Han. Yeah, you were, well, she's performing in North Dakota today. In fact, her concert just started about five minutes ago. What the heck was she thinking, right? <laughs> North Dakota, doesn't sound great to me. All right, um, especially this time of year. All right, uh, our uh, second lecture is about the New York, or the Los Angeles Times building bombing of 1910, and we brought in Howard Bloom, who is the author of 11 books. He's been nominated twice for a Pulitzer Prize for his investigative reporting. He formerly was a reporter for the Village Voice and the New York Times and he's a regular contributor to Vanity Fair. In fact, he's got three books about this time period, one called The Floor of Heaven, about the Yukon gold rush of the late 19th century. We have that book available at the back of the room after the lecture, as well as the book that this lecture is based on, American Lightning. And he's just come out with a new book, which you can pre-order. Uh, it'll be out, I guess, in the stores in a couple of weeks, called uh, Dark Invasion. It's about the Germany's secret war against America in 1915. So we're happy to have Howard Bloom here. In fact, where is Howard? Howard, where are you? Oh, way at the back of the room. <laughs> Come on up and join us, Howard. Please join me in welcoming Howard Bloom to the White House. Lecture Theater. This afternoon, I want to tell you a story. It's a story about America in the Gilded Age, a tale of the country's coming of age, maturing as it struggled to find a solution to the growing problems it was experiencing as a newly industrialized nation. It's a story about America nearly pushed to the breaking point at the beginning of the 20th century. 
a story about America almost at the verge of a second civil war, a war between labor and capital, unless the problems of the new industrialization were prudently, reasonably, and equitably addressed by the nation. But at the core, the story I'm going to tell today is a mystery story, a whodunit about a crime that when it occurred was called the crime of the century. It's also a tale about three men caught up in this crime and its aftermath. Three men whose lives were characterized by talent, by energy, flawed men, but whose actions in response to this crime of the century changed not only the times in which they live, but also the nation or the future. But in the beginning, there was the crime. And see if I can work the slides here. Get one of my kids to do this kind of stuff. I can't really do this. But there, in the beginning, this is the Los Angeles Times building in, in, in 1910. And on the morning of October 1st, 1910 in Los Angeles, the Los Angeles Times was hit by a booming and terrifying explosion. The sixth floor wing of the building, which you can see there uh, on your, your right, uh, was shoved off completely. Uh, and fires started raging. Uh, the building was shook as if by a malicious force. Uh, and the south wall started cracking. And then this was fired by a series of explosions in rapid succession. Boom, boom, boom. Five more explosions. And the second floor was completely burning. And huge linotype machines. Linotype machines were about as big as the railroad car out in the pavilion. They started hurling down uh, from the second floor into the basement where they hit the gas mains. And once they hit the gas mains, uh, a firestorm shot up and there was columns of intense red heat. Uh, ink barrels ignited. Uh, the newsprint took, caught fire. And in less than four minutes, the building had become a cauldron of smoke, heat, and flames. See, there's a this is the, the aftermath, before and after. Uh, at the time of the blast, a late night crew of about 100 people were at work putting the paper to bed. Uh, as soon as the, the fire started, the heat quickly became unbearable, and they ran to the exit doors. The exit doors didn't open. Uh, people were uh, started to jump uh, from the third floor. Uh, it's a long way down in a concrete uh, sidewalk, and people died on, on landing. And all 21 people died. Uh, among the injured were uh, linotype operators, editors, printers, pressmen, com uh, compositors, telegraph operators. 16 people were seriously wounded. And most of the people who died left widows and children. And in the aftermath of this horrible event, you can see the crowd there, Los Angeles was, was mesmerized, as was the nation. Was this an accident? Was it sabotage? Why would anyone want to destroy the LA Times building? And who, if anyone, was to blame? Well, as fate would have it, at that very day that the blast occurred, William J. Burns arrived in Los Angeles. At 49, William J. Burns was famous. The New York Times called him the only detective of genius who the country has produced. For 24 years, he had worked in the U.S. Secret Service, and he solved a number of celebrated cases. The San Francisco Mint was robbed of, of bags of double eagles, and he was the only one who could figure out how they mounted the thief and managed to uh, get the double eagle coins out of this mint. There was a perfect $100 bill uh, counterfeit that was spread throughout the country. He found the counterfeiters. And then President Teddy Roosevelt uh, sent him to San Francisco on a mission uh, to clean up the city, to get rid of the cabal of, of politicians and mobsters who were running San Francisco as their private fiefdom. And it took him several years, uh, but he did it. He was tenacious, flamboyant, ingenious, and he'd be the first to admit, uh, a bit theatrical. Uh, he was very proud of his reputation as the American Sherlock Holmes. That's what the, the London Times called him. But now, uh, Billy, as I call him in my book, I decided to become rich. He had just formed the Burns Detective Agency. Uh, and he had offices in uh, something like 20 cities. There were 1,200 operators. And he was determined to finally cash in on his celebrity. 
and on the day of the Los Angeles Times bombing, he had come to uh, the city to make a speech to his biggest client, the American Bankers Association. And it happened on the morning of uh, the LA Times bombing. He was in his hotel room going over his speech, I guess sort of like I did this morning, uh, but he was in the room at the Alexandria Hotel. I was in a much less nice hotel, I guess. Uh, uh, and the phone rang, and it was downstairs lobby, and they said it was Mayor George Alexander, the mayor of Los Angeles, coming up to see him. And Mayor Alexander came in and announced, uh, I've looked all over the country to find you. I've sent telegrams everywhere, only to find out you were in my city. This must be fate. I want you to, to, hire, to hire you to find the men responsible for this bombing, whoever it is, solve the case. And Billy thought about this for about a minute. I mean, here's a chance to get more celebrity. There already, already was over $100,000 in rewards. Uh, it was a kind of big case uh, that he, he lived for. So he agreed he would take it. He just had one caveat, that he would, only, he would not deal with the mayor or the city council until he had solved the case, until he came to them to give him the solution and to collect his reward money. The mayor had no choice to agree, so uh, Billy canceled his, his appointment with the American Bankers Association, I don't know whatever happened to that speech, and he went instead to the scene of the crime, and as he was going through the lobby of the Alexander Hotel, let's see, I think we should have a picture of that, see, it's, a, it's an elegant Rococo hotel, it was the place to stay in Los Angeles at 1910, he saw the second person who figures prominently in this story, a man whose life and ambitions uh, were also shaped by the crime of the century. This was David Wark Griffith, uh, D.W. Griffith, as he soon became famously known. And D.W. had also, oddly enough, five years earlier had been a detective. He played a detective on stage in a San Francisco production where he played Warbutton, a cigar-chomping private eye who put on a many farcical disguises. He even disguised himself as a grizzly bear, a society dowager, a drunkard to get his man. Uh, but then he, after being on stage, he decided he wanted to become a playwright. So he went off with his wife, Linda, to New York, started writing plays, except no one wanted to produce them. Uh, so he was quickly going broke. So he decided he would put his scruples behind him, he would write for the fledgling Nickelodeon business, uh, the movies that were just coming out, short eight-minute eight films. And he took the subway up to the Bronx where the Edison studio existed. And he tried to sell them a script. In those days, there was really no dialogue. He just blanked out eight minutes of action, and it would be then shot on the screen. And, and best of all, for this little bit of work, you could earn $30. Writers were always well paid. And he took this up to the Edison studio as a version of the opera Tosca. And they weren't interested in that, but they instead they offered him a role in one of the, of the movies they were shooting, the one real films. And he was drafted to play the intrepid hero who climbs a formidable mountain to rescue a baby, which was a doll, from a very inert and stuffed eagle, obviously. So uh, it took four days to shoot the movie it was shot in the studio and then in, on location in the wilds of New Jersey and he received $20 for his work and he also discovered this is fun $20 and having a good time too so he was hooked he wanted to uh, be in the movie business and he started working for a competitor of the Edison studio the biograph uh, company which was based on 14th Street in lower Manhattan and the bio he was busy writing scripts there were 9,000 Nickelodeons around the country, and the Biograph Company had to turn out two scripts a week. I think I just lost my Blackbird. <laughs> Sorry. I thought I paid the bill this month. I didn't know. Every time. Next, I'll be taking my car. This is scaring me. Probably my kids calling asking for money. But uh, D.W. Griffith then started 
working at the Biograph studio, and one day while he was working there as an actor, Old Man McCutcheon, who was a director, uh, took ill. He was actually too drunk to work that day. So with all the improbability of a silent film melodrama, uh, D.W. was drafted. First, they, they asked other actors, and they didn't want to do it. In those days, being a director was not the exalted position it is now. You just sort of put the actors in front of the camera, show them where to stand. It's more like a stage manager. But D.W. Griffith said, OK, I'll, I'll give it a try. And he was given this script, a short script, called The Adventures of Dolly. It was about a, a child who was taken by gypsies and she was rescued finally. She goes tumbling over a, a, a falls and was shot in four days. And it was shot in Hackensack, New Jersey. And after those four days, that was the first film he directed. It was a success. The movie did very well. And he went on to make other films. This is a scene from one of his other films, uh, one of his more political films, which we'll get into. Uh, so Billy was, was walking through the Alexander Hotel, and he saw his old friend, D.W. Griffith. They had first met on another case. Billy was trying to solve the murder of a 10-year-old girl who had been killed in New Jersey. And he pretty, was pretty well convinced he had found his man. He couldn't uh, though get the man to, to confess, and he couldn't quite put the case together. But he was, had the man follow him. They saw that every night, the man would go to the Nickelodeon on 14th Street. And so Billy came up with an idea. He went to D.W. Griffith, introduced himself, and asked if he could borrow a film about a young girl in jeopardy. And uh, D.W. Griffith, in those days, had quite many films about young girls in jeopardy. That was one of the, the staples of his repertoire. Uh, he liked women in terrorized situations. So they, they played, instead of the comedy that was going to be shown at the Nickelodeon that night, they showed the uh, movie about the young girl being terrorized, and Billy sat behind the suspect in the darkened Nickelodeon, watched him squirm, he couldn't uh, face it. And afterwards, Billy went up to him and then tried to get him to confess. And in that mood, the murderer actually confessed. And, and Billy, like D.W., saw the power and energy of film and how it could affect emotions. But on, on that day, when he, they first met in the Alexandria Hotel, D.W. had come from New York with his entire troupe, the entire Biograph Company. And they had come to Los Angeles to set up what was going to be the first movie studio in Hollywood. You could shoot all year round. You wouldn't have to be in Hackensack, New Jersey, to shoot your movies. Uh, so he bought, rented a little shack on a lot. He had his men put up a fence without asking anybody. And that was the, the first movie studio. And Hollywood was born. Uh, and as time passed, his movies would go away from uh, the terrorized young women that he was <laughs> doing when he was in New York, but because of the events of the Los Angeles uh, Times, become more political. Uh, this is a scene uh, from Corner of Wheat, which is a, about unscrupulous wheat commodity traders. Sounds familiar, too. Uh, but at the time, Billy tried to find theories about what was, who could have been behind the LA Times uh, bombing when he went over to the building. And his first theory, one that was being discussed a great deal in town, was that the, the heavyset man with the white mustache in the mid middle, Harrison J. Otis, uh, was behind the bombing. Uh, Otis uh, owned the LA Times, and he had just taken out just a week before the bombing, a $100,000 insurance policy on the building. Coincidental. And on the day of the bombing, he had made a trip to Mexico uh, that Billy thought was sort of specious, uh, seemed to him perhaps a way of establishing an alibi. But would Otis really need the insurance money? He lived in uh, a mansion, uh, and actually lived like a potentate. He drove a car chauffeured limo, actually Rolls Royce, and went through town and had a cannon mounted, mounted on the hood. And you don't even see those on Worth Avenue. But he, he had those to keep the hoi polloi away from him. But after a little uh, digging, uh, Billy found that Otis was a little financially strapped. He and his son-in-law, Harry Chandler, 
had started buying up land in the Fernando Valley. Uh, they had bought up, for pennies really, uh, 47,500 acres in the San Fernando Valley. And their vision was that they would turn this into single family housing, one little house after the other. But the only way this plan would work, if there was water, so they could, grass could grow on the lawns, uh, water come out of the faucets, and the valley the de was a desert, was arid. But Otis had this great plan. He would get the water to there from an a, uh, aqueduct that was built with taxpayers' money, ostensibly, to bring water to Los Angeles, but it would be siphoned off uh, to go to the San Fernando Valley. Except the opposition party, the Socialist Party, found out about this plan, and they were making a stink, and they had a pretty convincing argument that why should uh, the people of Los Angeles help uh, Otis get richer? Uh, and it was very likely that uh, the Socialist Party would come into power at the next election, and that then his investment would be worthless, and $100,000 would come in quite handy. And th that drama, also of uh, water in Los Angeles, inspired a movie uh, an eight-minute film by a D.W. Griffith called The Last Drop of Water. It was sort of the intellectual precursor uh, to Polanski's Chinatown, but without Jack Nicholson or, for that matter, the incest uh, plotline. Meanwhile, Otis had his own suspect. The day after the bombing, on borrowed presses, the Los Angeles Times came out and the headline read, Unionist Bomb Wreck." the Times. And while Otis had no proof that the unions were involved, it was a pretty good guess because there was no denying that Los Angeles had become a battleground between the forces of labor and capital. And there was one real reason why uh, battle seemed to be being fought in Los Angeles more than any other city in the country, and that was Otis. Uh, there were three dailies in Los Angeles, and they all were union shops. But Otis came up with a plan. He went to the other newspaper owners, and he said, well, we're going to make a stand. We're going to uh, force the topographers out. We're going to make them accept a 20% pay cut. And the union men, in response to this, announced that they would go on strike. There'd be no papers. Within weeks, uh, the other two papers made a deal with the unions. They said, OK but not Otis. He forced the union men to leave, which was his intention all along, and he hired non-union workers uh, to do the job. So there was real animosity towards him. And the city was really galvanized. You'd walk down one street, you'd have a pro-union baker, the next street would be a non-union baker. Uh, everywhere you went, there was a national railroad strike. And with this sort of torment brewing, it was easy for Billy uh, to believe that maybe this was an anti-capital bombing, and maybe the unions were involved, and maybe 21 lives were lost be because of this political dispute. But Billy was primarily a detective, and he, theories can only take you so far, and he had to deal with facts. So he had to find clues, and he began with looking at the bomb itself that blew up the Los Angeles Times. Let's see the next one. This is part of the dynamite that, that was used here, the box of dynamite. Very, very arresting photograph, I guess, of a wooden box. But uh, Billy, it was uniquely 80% uh, dynamite. And that wasn't really uh, readily available in Los Angeles. In those days, this sort of construction dynamite used for construction projects was in San Francisco. So Billy decides to go up to the Bay Area, and he goes, spent several weeks going from uh, munitions factory to munitions factory looking to see if anyone had ordered this 80% dynamite. And he's able to pick up a clue uh, from a company that fronted right on the Oakland, Oakland Bay. And uh, three men described him as out-of-towners uh, had come and they had bought just days before the LA bombing uh, cartons or crates like that of the 80% dynamite. And they, their names they didn't have, but one of the clerks remembered they went in a boat to pick up the dynamite, take it across the bay, uh, called the Pastime. So Billy searches for the records for the boats and the city 
uh, licenses. You can find uh, nothing uh, for the boat for the pastime. But he doesn't give up. He finally goes to a, a boat rental yard, and the owner tells him, yeah, the men you were talking about, I think there was someone like that here, but they never, we have no boat called the pastime. We have a boat called the peerless. So Billy rents the peerless. But he doesn't take it out to sea. He starts scraping off the paint, and underneath the you know, pastime, you can see, he discovers that someone had, before had, had painted the, the, uh, on the, the peerless, he finds the name pastime. So this was a boat. And the owner happened to have the address of the men who rented this boat. So this is pretty good. He has a name and address. He goes over there thinking this is going to solve this case pretty quickly. And he gets there, and it's a vacant lot. So he thinks, OK, his detective mind starts ticking. These guys are from out of town, but they knew enough to use this address as a vacant lot. They had brought the explosives across the bay, but they weren't going to take them through the city of San Francisco. They must have had their munitions factory where they built the actual bombs that were used somewhere nearby here. So he decides to go house to house to house. And it takes him a while. He finds a, an abandoned rooming house where there are the cases uh, of, like this of the dynamite, of empty cases there. And he said, well, OK, this is good but there's no name of anyone who was there. But the, the cases were covered by canvas, and the canvas was new. So he goes to a variety of hardware stores, and he finds, finally, the hardware store that sold the canvas, and he gets a name. Now, and he now has a, a name to track down. Now, on a TV show like CSI, you know, you've got to compress the investigation into an hour with commercials too, and so not much time. So let me try to compress this a bit. You know, from having this name, Billy goes off on a meandering trail that takes him across America for the next almost a year. He goes to an anarchist camp in the Midwest, and when he gets there, there's a riot going on because one of the anarchist groups wanted nude uh, bathing, the other didn't. Uh, then he follows one of the suspects into the Wisconsin woods on a hunting expedition, and he has to stay behind him and pose as a hunter. And you saw what he looks like. He's about five foot five and shaped like a tea cozy, wearing this hunter's uniform, little red hat. Uh, he stuck out there, but he did that. Then he finds that one of the suspect's wife in, goes to a fortune teller in Cincinnati, and he bribes the fortune teller to have her ask questions. And finally, the trail leads him to Indianapolis, where he finds his suspects. These are the McNamara brothers. J.J. McNamara was head of the Bridge and Structural Iron Workers Union, and his brother uh, Jim is his right-hand man. This is rule C. So he has the two men, and he then decides he has to bring them back to Los Angeles for trial, because he has to do that to get his reward money. So they're extradited without any extradition, there's a, this is one of the uh, posters that was put out by the Union forces uh, protesting it. And as soon as they're arrested, battle lines start being drawn. These are the, the two McNamara brothers. Uh, on one side is the Los Angeles Times, which is saying, Detective Burns has unearthed the most tremendous criminal conspiracy in the history of America. While Samuel Gompers of the American Federation of Labor, which is relatively conservative group says, uh, we know for a fact that these men who have been arrested on charges that are completely false. I have investigated the whole case and Burns has lied. So the whole nation is galvanized. And at this point comes into the tale the third man who plays a role in the story, and that's Clarence Darrow. Now Clarence Darrow, three years earlier, was a great liberal champion. He had charged into battle to defend a man known as Big Bill Haywood, who was accused of murdering uh, the anti-union governor of Idaho, former governor of Idaho, and he, he got them off. But in the process of this defense, Darrow got sick, he took him close to a year to recuperate, and he had lost all his money. So now, at the time of the Los Angeles Times bombing, Darrow is back in Chicago, and he's trying to make money from the law. At the time of the bombing, 
Uh, he's involved in a case where a Civil War pensioner is, is suing a group of Milwaukee uh, bankers who, who he, the pensioner is saying they built them out of all the money he had in the world. And Darrow is defending the Milwaukee bankers. So, but Gompers is convinced that uh, Darrow is the only one who can save, save the day. And he comes to Darrow and, and says, please take this case. It's an important case. Uh, the future of America is at stake. Darrow says no. Finally, after two weeks of, of arguing, Darrow negotiates a $50,000 fee for himself, which is a, a fortune those times, plus a $200,000 defense fund. So he goes out to Los Angeles, and he too moves into the Alexandria Hotel. At this point, uh, Billy is uh, beginning his, the pretrial investigation, what he's doing. He's bugging the uh, rooms where the attorneys meet with their clients. <laughs> but Darrow, not to be outdone, is sending his emissaries out to witnesses and offering them bribes, in effect, jobs, if, if they'll testify on his behalf. Well, uh, D.W. Griffith is, is watching all this, and his film's becoming more and more political. And as the trial then moves forward, Darrow makes a startling discovery. Not only has Billy Burns accumulated a great deal of evidence, but it's true. The brothers are guilty. So what's he going to do? They, they face the death penalty. What's uh, Clarence Darrow, the great crusading liberal lawyer, going to do? He tries, comes up with a plan that's to bribe one of the jurors. Uh, George Lockwood is offered $4,000 uh, if he'll vote for acquittal. I think it's this is Lockwood with a broom afterwards as reporters are coming to investigate him after he reported this bribe. Uh, and on the day that the $4,000 is passed to Lockwood, police are there to watch it. Darrow's on the next corner. And two things happen. Darrow is arrested, indicted for jury tampering. And he now also has this case. And it, Two brothers are going to face a death penalty, so he has to make a decision. He decides to plead them guilty. And that sort of diffuses the situation, except for Darrow, who goes on trial himself. You see, uh, in the courtroom, no one expected, after all the this battle lines being drawn, the brothers would, would plead guilty. And there is, is Darrow as he goes on, on trial. He, the tr Darrow's own trial lasts uh, three months, and he gives, he's represented by another lawyer, but he gives a summation himself. And he gets up there, talks for six hours, uh, and he says, I'm not going to talk to six hours. Uh, <laughs> but he says things like, uh, because I was a lover of the poor, a friend of the oppressed, because I stood by labor all these years, that's why they're accusing me. Never says he was not guilty. He says, I have been human, too human. Those are the sort of excuses uh, my kids give me when they want to get away with things. But he does win. He does. He's acquitted. He's not found guilty. It was effective. Uh, so he returns to Chicago. And we'll get, he returns to Chicago, and he decides, okay, I'm now going to try to change my life. And he gets involved again in using the law as a weapon to transform American life. He defends Thomas Scope and his scopes and his right to uh, teach evolution. He uh, argues against the death penalty for Leopold and Loeb. And what happens uh, to Billy Burns? Billy Burns gets his reward money, becomes celebrated, and he decides to go, in effect, into politics. Uh, he's appointed to uh, head by uh, President Warren G. Harding uh, the Bureau of Investigation in Washington. And he gets caught up, like many people who go into politics, in a scandal. This was the Teapot Dome scandal, selling oil leases. So he resigns and he moves down to Florida. Uh, and after, when he's just leaving, he hands over the reins of the Bureau of Investigation to his young assistant, a man by the name of uh, John Edgar Hoover. And Hoover changes the name to the Federal Bureau of Investigation. And American history is affected that way too. And as for D.W. Griffith, uh, he saw the power of politics uh, to affect the nation and to affect films. 
and he decides to make a movie called The Birth of the Nation. And The Birth of the Nation uh, is a film that he invests all his money into it. It's a flawed film, it's racially prejudiced, but it is a, an important film, a, a brilliant film in establishing a powerful dramatic narrative. And this is in a, a time when a big blockbuster movie made $10,000. Birth of the Nation in 1919 grosses $60 million, and the Hollywood blockbuster is established. And so, from the actions of these three men, uh, a second civil war, a war between labor and capital, is, is averted. But we also see terrorism, domestic terrorism, enters American life. Uh, but within five years, international terrorism uh, becomes part of American life. Uh, and within five years, in 1915, while uh, world war is raging in Europe, German terrorists come to this country, set up a cell, they bomb the U.S. Capitol building, they set up an anthrax lab six blocks from the White House and begin a bio-warfare attack on three American cities. They bomb munitions factories, they shoot J.P. Morgan, Jr., a special task force is set up by the New York City Police Department, uh, headed by a detective, Tom Tooney, to track them down. And these events, uh, this birth of international terrorism, are the story that I tell in my book that will be on sale Tuesday, uh, Dark Invasion. Uh, and in many ways, Dark Invasion is a sequel to the events in American Lightning. Uh, but both are united by being a story about America, a story about America coming of age and moving forcefully into the new century. Thank you. And I guess if you have the questions, I'll be glad to answer them. There's a question back here. Yeah, what was the sentence that the McNamara shot? Uh, life, they got life sentence, and but the younger brother was was out within 20 years. So it was a life sentence, but somehow it got reduced over time. People forgot about it. I mean, I think the nation as a whole was so glad that this situation was diffused, and they were ready to move on with it. Howard, they were convicted of this bombing, but how many other bombings did they plan? And how many did they execute? They were in, involved in when they were making the case against them. The number was 23, uh, and there was a, it was because you can see, it was took burns to tie events that happened in New Haven at a railroad together with what happened in Los Angeles. There wasn't reported in the news. It was like a serial killer, and suddenly they found, well, this case is tied to the next one. Uh, it was a real cultural lag. How long did the investigation take total? Repeat the question so the online folks can hear. How long did the investigation take total? Uh, Burns was involved for a little over two years. Question here? Sir? Uh, the brothers were apprehended in the Midwest? Yes, Indianapolis. The, where were the brothers apprehended in Indianapolis? What is the, the connection or conspiracy that tied this Midwest group to the West Coast? What, what tied, why did the brothers in the Midwest hit the West Coast group? In many ways, it's like terrorism today. Uh, they wanted to make a political point, and, and Otis was a symbol uh, of all that was anti-union. So they decided after bombing bridges and railroads in the East and in the Midwest, they would hit Otis, and this revolted in the 21 deaths. It's almost, he was a symbol, uh, just the way terrorists today, move towards the World Trade Center, really. That was a symbol of America. Um, did it affect Gomper's reputation for defending guys that were guilty of the Union and such? Yes, and very much so. Not only did he defend them, but he said it so adamantly. I mean, he said, you know, Burns was making all this up. Uh, he made it quite clear. Uh, I mean, he put himself out on a limb, and, you know, he got away with it too, but it's just you know, like Chris Christie's denied everything he said. If it comes out that he's not telling the truth, we'll see how it affects him. It seems that people in the public eye can say things and then walk away from it. Sir? 
repeat the question. Were there other people involved besides the brothers? Yes, there were a, a group of people, uh, sort of ne'er-do-well uh, people who actually placed the bombs at the sites, and Ordi Mechanical. Uh, these were people that uh, Darrow tried to get his wife, provide her with money so she wouldn't testify. It's, it's, all, it's a very convoluted story, but there was, was a whole network of people. What they never got, what they never proved, were, were any other higher level union, official, union officials involved. This question is a couple at the back. I can't see, yes? Yeah. What was the effect of the overall the question is, what effect did this have on unions? Well, it seemed to, oddly enough, lessen the antagonisms. Uh, there, were, there were no more attempts, at least for the time being, to break union shops, uh, and the unions were sort of mobilized, even though they, they lost this case, uh, they were able to recruit people. They even, they made their own movie about why you should join unions. Movies were just coming into vogue. Uh, so it had, uh, it didn't affect the unions deeply, uh, but it did affect the reputation of, of actually of the Otis and Chandler. Uh, they were sort of looked at as pariahs for having forced this situation. Well, it would the net effect be positive or negative? That's a judgmental question, which I don't really know that I I can answer. I think that's sort of beyond my expertise, quite frankly. But I, I'll say positive. Though. There's a question over here at the front, sir. <coughs> Did Otis get his uh, order to the San Fernando Valley? He eventually got it, but not. Uh, what happened was the, so, the one effect of this trial, the men being pleaded guilty, the Socialist Party which was set to win the election, lost. Uh, and, and George Alexander, the mayor, uh, who had hired Burns, was re-elected, and he pushed through the water for the San Fernando Valley, the aqueduct bill. Yeah, there's the question right here. The president publisher is named Otis Chandler. What's the... Uh... <laughs> yeah. uh, he's great, 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 great uh, son-in-law and nephew. It's the same family, it's passed on. Sir? They were the victim. What were the victim of the bombing? The victims of the bombings were all union members. So uh, again, these union men had killed killed their own. Uh, that was another one of the tragedies. Some believe we're on the verge of another battle between labor and capital. How polarized? How, the question is, how polarized were income levels? Uh, well, the 1% back then was really, really rich, and that was before income taxes. Uh, look what you're in, look where you are, uh, look around you. Uh, it's, it was, the polarization was quite complete. Uh, and that's what's so interesting, people, why the Nickelodeon became so popular. Uh, for a nickel, you could, you could go out and get three hours of entertainment. Uh, one of the Warner Brothers was working at a uh, haberdashery in Baltimore. And he, uh, Nickelodeon opened up across the street, and he sat there in his store, and he saw, I saw them across the street. Nichols just came rolling in, that was his words. Nichols came rolling in all day, and he realized that maybe there was a future to be made in the movie business. Thank you very much.